began the book club by reading works of art. Uh, excuse me, I always say that works of art by Charles Birchfield, but we read the books that Charles Birchfield read. But very quickly, we decided to switch gears a little bit and to honor those Western New York authors, just as we honor the Western New York artists in our collection, we are honoring the authors by inviting them to come and share their work with you. Tonight, I'm very excited to have an author who I was a little bit skeptical about reading as he calls himself a science fiction writer and I rarely read science fiction, but I think you're going to find him to be quite delightful. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce our staff. Emily is hosting the meeting today. So Emily, could you wave? Oh. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's only um, the speaker view, so oh. hello. What does that mean, the speaker view? Those that can talk. Oh, Michaela. Hi. I'm Mary Koza. And um, we're going to start with Michaela, who is going to explain the mechanics of tonight's meeting. Michaela? Yeah. So, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm just going to take a minute um, to tell you how to use this webinar so you can participate during the book club. Um, so first you probably noticed that you can't see yourself or we can't hear you um, and that's intentional. So if you have any questions for the author, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you move your mouse, you can see the options at the bottom of your screen pop up. Um, use that section to write your questions and then throughout this evening, I will be reading those um, aloud. This recording of this book club is being recorded, so just so you know, but anyone on the screen, that's who's being recorded. So no one in the participant group that registered is being recorded. Um, so again, if you have any questions for Rick this evening in regards to his books, use the Q&A button and I will be uh, interjecting throughout the evening with those participant questions. Thank you, Michaela. Now I'd like to introduce my friend, Fran Sullivan. And Fran, if you were with us last month, also facilitated that book club, but I wrangled him in again today, mostly because he's a very close friend of tonight's author. Fran is a wonderful member of our book club who comes often, and I'm so delighted that he's here tonight. So Fran, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you'd be kind enough to introduce tonight's author. Thank you for a moment there. I thought you were gonna read my bio. <laughs> Could do that. Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure if, if the bio on, on Rick, much of it's uh, able to be seen on Facebook, but I want to start by talking about Rick himself. He's a dad. Um, I knew him as a soccer dad. He was here for a number of years. His, his daughter, uh, they lived in Western New York through her high school years. Um, he invests in people, he invests in students. He takes students uh, abroad every year. Um, he he promotes writing, he promotes learning, he promotes ha people having a uh, real down to earth sets of values um, for each other. So that's the Rick that I know. Um, I'm gonna skim through the, the bio here. He's published a uh, half dozen novels, short story collections, several college textbooks on writing and mass media, um, memoir about his father in baseball. It doesn't say this, but I think Rick might have been a bat boy for the Boston Red Sox when he was five. Um, the year might be wrong. Age might be wrong. Um, he includes Sideways Award winning Something Real and the poignant Today is Today reprinted in this year's Best Science Fiction Fantasy 2019. Um, both stories and seven more tales of determination are in the collection Rambunctious, Nine Tales of Determination, which I think Rick will talk about today also. He's the editor of several reprint anthologies, including Field of Fantasies, Baseball Stories of the Strange and Supernatural. You have to read this. You have to read that book. It is, it is, it'll hold you whether you like baseball or not. Um, you see George H.W. Bush, instead of going to politics, he was playing baseball. You see Fidel Castro. I mean, these are stories about other people. One of them is from Rick. Um, the female authors, male authors. Um, Fidel Castro went into baseball instead of politics. It's just, they're really great stuff. Um, okay, where do we go here? Alien Morning is a, is a novel. He's a finalist for the John W. Campbell Memorial Award for Best Science Fiction Novel of 2016, the sequel Alien Day, and the sequel Alien Day. Notes from Homanville will be out in 2020. 
Oh, it's Alien Day knows from Homanville. Sorry. The son of a major league baseball player and coach and a three sport college scholarship athlete himself. He often incorporates sports into his fiction. He's a father with Down syndrome son and often incorporates the disabled in his fiction as well. Um, he incorporates things that aren't fiction as well, too. <laughs> um, he's a visiting professor in the low residency MFA in creative writing at Western Colorado University. He is co-founder and co-judge with Asimov's science fiction magazine editor, Sheila Williams of the Dell Magazine Award for Undergraduate Excellence in Science Fiction and Fantasy Writing. It's awarded annually at the International Conference on the Fantastic in Orlando, Florida. Um, when Rick was here, I need to tell you that part of investment in believing what you're doing and sticking to it, he was teaching at the University of South Florida when he lived in Western New York and he commuted. His, his, his son was there. His daughter was here, his wife was here. She was a prophet in Niagara. Um, and he doesn't talk about all those kind of things, but you're, you know, he's coming into a soccer game. He's flying in from Florida to make a game for his daughter. It's really, it's just, uh, he's a remarkable guy. So what else can I say? We're going to, um, <laughs> I think that probably there's so much to talk about with the book. Um, uh, making history is, um, there's, a number of stories and I just reread it. I can talk about each one all by myself. I, it's probably best if we have Rick do that. The new book I'm not as familiar with. I've skimmed it. I've read descriptions of it. Um, and I'm read looking it thoroughly. To that. Hmm? I read the new one thoroughly. Good, good. Skim the other one. Okay, so where do we go from here? Where would you like to go, Rick? Well, I, we can start by talking about the Making History anthology, maybe talking about how that idea came to be and then how Perfect. I went about acquiring the stories, what my thinking was with, with the story. Yeah, and that typically um, works really well for the book club members. Good. All right. So, so I was, um, I've edited uh, several anthologies, reprint anthologies and um, um, about the future of the media called slyly called future media. <laughs> and um uh, and another one, uh, Field of Fantasies, which is a collection of baseball fantasy or science fiction stories. Um, many of them by very famous writers, Stephen King um, uh, among them, and, and um, a lot of mainstream writers uh, and genre writers. Uh, and so I had an editor at a, um, a publishing house contact my agent who contacted me and said, would you like to do an ebook that is, um, uh, that is a, a collection of alternate history stories? Well, I write a lot of alternate history. I enjoy alternate history. I enjoy history of any kind, but alternate history is the kind of history where if, um, if, um, if what would have happened if John Wilkes Booth had missed by three inches instead of killing Lincoln, how would that have changed history? And then an alternate history story would then follow that line. And it, obviously, totally different America today because reconstruction would have been totally, completely different. So it's filled with, um, with those kind of stories where there's usually, it's, um, it's called a hinge when you're one of the writers and your hinge moment is that moment when something happens another way than it did in our history. Um, the, um, uh, the spirit of St. Louis crashes in the ocean instead of making it all the way across the Atlantic. Charles Lindbergh dies, what happens to history? So there are any number of places you can do this. And it's a very popular form with writers, both mainstream writers and science fiction and, and fantasy writers, because it's a lot of fun. Um, because most writers, all the writers I know, love doing research. And, um, and there's so much research that needs to be done to do an alternate history story, because you have to know the real history before you can write the alternate history. So um, I said, sure, I'll do it. And, um, and I went out. And I, my thinking was that um, 
there are a number of really wonderful women alternate history writers, some of them quite famous as mainstream authors as well as um, science fiction authors, including most notably perhaps Karen Joy Fowler. And um, um, so if you, um, um, well, Fowler has been nominated for the, um, the Man Booker Award. Um, she's a very famous mainstream writer as well as writing genre fiction. And I happen to either know all these writers or I know the agent or I know someone who knows these writers. So I put together a list and I wanted it to be um, um, diverse. I wanted there to be as many women writers as, as men writers. I wanted there to be uh, representation by, uh, by people of color. Um, and I wanted to show that alternate history appeals to all kinds of writers as well as all kinds of readers. Um, so to give you an idea about how much of this has been published, my initial list of stories that I really wanted to have was 88 stories long. Thanks. And and the publisher said, no, <laughs> no. Can you do it in 15 stories? And I said, no. And so we negotiated um, and got it like the 18 or 20 was our, was our thinking. Um, one of the things, one of the ways we did that is a little story I'll, I'll tell um, about this is a Ray Bradbury story in here the, um, that, um, that really co cost a lot of money. Um, no, the Bradbury is in another collection. It's the same kind of story. We'll come, we'll come back to that. So, so what happened was I, I got the list down and started contacting people and, um, you know how writers are, um, all writers are immensely wealthy um, and live great lives of luxury right. or perhaps not. So, so the, you know, most of these writers, I said to the writers, I said, I will give you a flat fee of $50 if I can have permission to reprint your story. And I got back emails from writers that said, $50? Wonderful, <laughs> great, because $53, 50 free dollars was, was great, 50 free bucks was great. So um, uh, Karen Joy Fowler was great about it and uh, she has a game night at the Fox and Goose which is um, um, alternate history, feminist story um, that's, a, that's a terrific story. And, um, and then the Lincoln Train by Maureen McHugh is another one. And it's, um, it's an after, after the Civil War ends differently story. We follow a different path. Um, and then on down the line, there are a couple more. Civil War is very popular with alternate history. So Manassas again by Greg Benford. Um, in terms of not doing the usual thing, I went to uh, a friend, an award-winning writer, Kathy Goonan, Kathleen Goonan, did Kamehameha's Bones, which is set um, mostly in Hawaii. She lived in Hawaii for much of her life. Um, we don't do enough alternate history that involves music, especially classical music. Um, and I had published a story of Louise Marley's before. Louise Marley wrote a wonderful um, women playing baseball uh, fantasy, science fiction fantasy story that I had reprinted in another anthology. And she was happy to take part. Um, I'm looking at these uh, at these writers. One of them, one of them is a good friend of mine. He and I have a book coming out together in in a month, actually. Alan Smale, and Alan is notable for being. Um, he writes alternate Roman history, and he and I have written an alternate Roman history baseball story. It'll be out. It'll be out in book form. Um, in about a month. But I went to Alan because he, he writes wonderful stuff about the Romans and he's originally from England. He does a great job when he's writing about the UK and he's my science source. He's the head, he's an Oxford educated astrophysicist who works at NASA Goddard. And for fun, he writes alternate Roman history stories. That's sort of his release. He's also in, um, pretty famous uh, acapella group, just a fascinating guy. 
And then I was happy to get a story from uh, Harry Turtledove is known as sort of the Dean of alternate history. He's written a number of novels um, and he writes a lot of baseball alternate history stories. And he wrote the house that George built, which is what if Babe Ruth had never made it to the big leagues and was a minor leaguer. And it's a, a ton of fun, very meant to be sort of fun. Nisi Shaw is some um, uh, fabulous woman of color. Um, and uh, hers is about um, um, vulcanization, which is um, Leopold of Belgium, a horrible, monstrous leader enslaved um, the Belgian Congo. Uh, what if things had gone different for him? Um, and then, and so on down the line, there's, there's a, others to do. There's some Arab alternate history, uh, some, and all of these stories um, required, then you get into the process of acquiring these. So all of these stories require that I talk first to the writer and if the writer says yes and doesn't take it to the agent, that's great. And we go and it's $50. But if the writer says, see my agent, then suddenly it's $500 <laughs> and I'm negotiating with an agent. Um, and a, a, that happened a couple of times here and my agent got involved with those agents and sort of kept it all reasonable. So eventually it took the better part of a year to put all pull all this together. And I wrote all the introductory matter, uh, explaining alternate history. Um, this is for New Word City Publishing, which has uh, primarily a female readership. Um, and so I wanted to make sure to include all those women writers, um, um, just to make it uh, clear to the, to the readers that, um, that this is a very popular form for women writers um, uh, to take part in. And uh, came out from New Word City, and lo and behold, it um, it went to at one point it went to number eight bestseller overall on Kindle for a few days, and it sold like hotcakes. So we were really really happy about that. Um, it never did get a print edition. Um, but I would still like to see a print edition of it someday, but that's sort of the process you go through for as a as an editor is you have to first narrow down who you want in the anthology and then make contact with all of them. And then you have to get um, either a digital copy or something you can convert to a digital copy of all the stories. And some of these stories are old enough that they were not originally digital. Um, and so that's just sort of, that's just sort of what you do. And, um, and in a few cases, the Stephen King story was some, uh, uh, that's also the Stephen, St Stephen King story is another one that's in the, uh, the baseball anthology, Field of Fantasies. And, um, and when I was doing that story, that's where the Ray Bradbury poem is as well. And in, that, uh, in the case of uh, Stephen King, um, he was terrific. I never got to talk to him directly, but through the intermediary of, a, of uh, on the phone actually with his agent and I think King on, on the other line. Um, and he was one of those cases where, yeah, sounds like fun. Um, and that, uh, that one did come out. That was originally um, a digital story. And it did come out in print when the Field of Fantasies book came out in print. So it was the first print edition of a Stephen King story. That's a little bit of a, a claim to fame. But what's fun about alternate history is, um, is to see all the what if stories um, and how different writers from different perspectives go about that process of writing those stories. Many of these stories are award winners. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. go ahead. In some of these, in some of your stories, I know you skipped over yours and Mo Burke's and, I, and they're my favorites. But, okay. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things you've done at least a couple times is end the story. And then at the end it says, well, one of them says, well, those are all lies. Here's what really happened. <laughs> and then you change it and, the, and the, the way you do it, it's hook, line and sinker, even though we know it's alternate fiction to begin with, but you're yeah. hook, line and sinker with it. And then you say, well, okay, well maybe, <laughs> and do it again. And, and <laughs> the nice touch I think is great for um, 
yeah, I think short stories. I, I didn't read many short stories since college, but um, it, I think the short story grabs you because they're, they're a hole in their, in their own entity. Uh, you can read them, you can finish them, but for young students, college students, potential writers, grad students, um, doing that piece at the end just is creative and it makes people's minds say, okay, what can I do to change it? And I think that's a, a nice touch as, as an instructor. Thank you. So let's talk about Mo Berg a little bit then, because Mo Berg um, is involved in one of the stories in Today is Today. And um, Mo Berg, the real, there was an actual historical Mo Berg, uh, Jewish uh, baseball player who, um, who was a modestly talented major leaguer, but a brilliant guy, he spoke seven or eight or nine or maybe 10 languages, European languages. Um, and was a modestly talented major leaguer for like 20 years. And um, true story, in World War II, he, um, he, he volunteered, couldn't get in, and he wound up being um, taken on by William Wild Bill Donovan, who was a World War I hero who became a top politician and was, was I'm trying to think, I think he was district attorney for Buffalo in, in the 1930s. And while Bill Donovan was hired by uh, FDR to be head of the new Office of Strategic Services that ultimately became the CIA. So in fact, if you go to the CIA website, they have a little history section and there's a, a little thing there on Mo Berg. Um, so Donovan wanted Berg um, for a specific, for several assignments because he spoke all those languages. And he was sort of a nondescript person to see. He didn't stand out, which was great for spy purposes. He could take on a lot of personas. So we were very worried in the 1940s that the Germans were building an atomic bomb. And we were very worried that they might build their bomb before we built our bomb. And so Mo Berg was given the assignment um, to go to neutral Switzerland, pretend to be a physicist, a nuclear physicist, um, go to a meeting in Zurich that had been arranged uh, in neutral Switzerland, that had been arranged where Werner Heisenberg was going to be the keynote speaker and a lecturer. And Heisenberg was the head of the German A-bomb program. And Berg's job was to pass himself off um, as an Italian physicist, attend that conference. And if it sounded to him at the speech that if it sounded to him like Heisenberg's team was heading in the right direction to build an atom bomb or was close to having it built, he was supposed to kill him as soon as possible, assassinate, assassinate Werner Heisenberg. Um, all of this is true in, in our reality, in our timeline, if you will, this, all of this is true. And Berg uh, was there, uh, talked to Heisenberg, talked to him later at a party, and decided that no, the Germans were not close. Um, and it turned out later that, that Berg was right, the Germans were not very close. And it's still an open question today whether Heisenberg was purposefully making sure the Germans didn't get close to building a bomb or if they really were just not able to build one. And so- uh, uh, Just for context, today is today is from your current book. Right. Today as is, is today, this story. As is this story, yes. Right. Um, right. So this story is from um, the rambunctious book, which is one of the two books we're talking about. Thank you. Right. One of the two books we're talking about this evening. So, um, so Berg goes, decides not to assassinate him, <clears throat> and, um, and it turns out to be correct. In fact, um, Heisenberg survives the war and goes on to have um, uh, many more years of, uh, of his career um, coming to, uh, to England and then to America, as so many German scientists did um, for the space program and for, and for our atomic program. So that story interested me so much because I have this baseball background and I feel like I know baseball pretty well. My father was a major leaguer. Um, 
for eight years and then he was a scout and he was a triple a manager for for many years won a couple of triple a pennants so i grew up in the dugouts and clubhouses i was not a bat boy for the boston red sox friend but i ran around shagging fly balls during batting practice at age five <laughs> and uh and I have a number of pictures. Dad brought a photographer one day for my older brother and I in our little Red Sox uniforms with dad in his uniform. And I still have those pictures. Um, so um, so that's why Mo Bird was so fascinating to me. And so I did um, an alternate history piece um, called Something Real that does an alternate history take on Mo Bird, offers a fictional version of that moment. So a number of writers have offered fictional versions of, of that moment. And I'm very happy to say that um, in came out in 2012, that short story, and it won the Sidewise Award for Best Alternate History Short Form of that year, which is an important award to alternate history writers. So I was very happy about that. Um, but that's an indication of my interest in alternate history and my, in, my interest in, in baseball. Um, and those are those are sort of leads me into the discussion about most writers have um, have something that they're close to that they know really well that they enjoy writing about. Um, you know, we had a little discussion earlier before before we went live, and. And for, the, for me, those things are sports. I was a football player and a basketball player and a baseball player in college and raised in a baseball family. And, um, um, and uh, I have a Down syndrome son. So there's a number of Down syndrome elements in this rambunctious story. These are some of my Down syndrome sort of stories. Although I use Down syndrome all the time I, because because I feel comfortable writing about Down syndrome, having been um, the parent of a Down syndrome child since um, uh, his mother left when he was five and he's now 51. So he's been my guy all those, all those years. And, um, uh, and he's not a very good baseball player, but he's a very good basketball player, I should, I should point out, <laughs> Special Olympics athlete. So I tend to write on those things where I'm really comfortable and those things um, tend to be, um, we talked a little bit about Catholicism. I'm certainly a cultural yeah. Catholic, raised, raised Catholic. Um, Down syndrome, I write about that a lot. Sports, um, maybe too much. I write about, uh, about baseball, but baseball has a great literary tradition. So that's another reason to be comfortable there's a uh, lot of soccer about. and quite a bit of basketball in there. Also yeah. a lot of basketball. And that comes from having played, having played some basketball in college. I actually, I, I walked on to the college basketball team and the coach kept me on the team. So, um, but by played college basketball, I meant, I mean, sat on the bench of the college basketball team down at the end of the bench. Um, but I was a pretty good shooter and I would get in and score some points now and then. Um, this combines my interest in writing as well, because the local paper, this was at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, which was um, the other campus of Southern Illinois. And um, because I was down on the bench and wasn't playing very much, the local paper, the Edwardsville, Illinois Intelligencer, one of the great newspaper names, by the way, the Intelligencer, hired me to cover the away games. My job was to sit on the bench and take notes and then when the game was over, write up my notes and call it into the paper. And, um, and they wouldn't put my name on it because that seemed a little unfair somehow. But I was your trusty correspondent covering the games from one of the better seats in the house, I guess, on the bench. Um, and so I tend to write about, about those things. Um, and as it happens, we spent six great years living in Western New York. Um, my wife taught at Niagara University um, our daughter went to Lewiston Porter High School, middle school and high school. Um, she got a great education there. Um, we were very happy with, with her life there. Uh, but my son, my Down syndrome son, did not want to leave Florida where he was very settled in. And I had my job at the University of South Florida at the time. So Fran, you mentioned that I commuted back and forth weekly about 35 
times a year, flying down on the dawn plane out of Buffalo Airport, like at 5 a.m., teaching my class, um, staying there till uh, Wednesday night or first thing Thursday morning, and then flying back up to Buffalo. Um, it was a really interesting perspective, and I haven't written enough about that yet, I think, on life, because I felt like I was leading three lives. I was leading my Buffalo life, which was great, uh, cross-country skiing in the winter, and I, and I loved it there. Old Fort Niagara, I was a history buff. That was fabulous. The Niagara River Gorge to walk in, to hike in was fabulous. And then I lived my life in Florida, which has its own appeal, um, especially in the winter, not so much this time of year, but especially in the winter. And then I lived like the airplane life, like a lot of frequent flyers do, where I knew all the ins and outs of all the airports. Um, there were no, at the time, there were almost no nonstop flights between Tampa and Buffalo. So I was always changing planes somewhere, usually Charlotte, and um, flying US Airways in those days. And I knew just where to go to sit to get the best stuff. And I had lounges. And, um, and you just become sort of in three different cultures at, at once. Um, but after six or seven years of that, I'd, I'd had enough of it. Our daughter had graduated from high school. My wife got a job teaching in St. Petersburg at St. Petersburg College, a, a great job teaching finance. And, um, and I came back and just sort of rejoined my life uh, in Florida. We still get up there. We haven't done it this year. We still get up to Western New York when we can. Um, love that area. Beautiful area especially this time of year, you know, June, July, and August. I remember, I remember when I was flying back and forth um, between the Tampa airport and the Buffalo airport, that there would be a shift in seasons. And suddenly the weather was much better in Buffalo than it was in Tampa, St. Pete, where it was 95 and in, in evening thunderstorms every day. And it was beautiful sunshine on the Lake Ontario shore. Um, but then would come November, <laughs> and things would switch and uh and suddenly um um it was uh western new york in the winter and it was uh florida um in the winter and uh, and i felt that sometimes i felt i was lucky it was uh, like being a snowbird only weekly instead of once a year moving back and forth all so right really, so I yes have, go ahead i have some i have two questions from one of our participants uh, the first is going, it's all going back to the alternate history stories. Um, right. So when writing an alternate history story, how much do authors concern themselves with the plausibility of their alternate version? You've raised a very significant question. And there's really two things to concern yourself with. One of them is plausibility. Um, and if you're inventive enough, um, you can hint at why it's plausible without getting into too much detail. That's the iceberg principle of writing, where you have to do all the research, but just like nine tenths of an iceberg is below the waterline, nine tenths of your research stays below the waterline. The reader never sees it, but now you have enough of that research that you can use just the right material um, to take the story in some new and, and interesting direction. But plausibility really only works as a function of how well does the reader understand the real history, because it's hard to appreciate the alternate history if you're not familiar. If you don't know that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, then all of those alternate history stories where Lincoln was not assassinated don't quite make sense to you. So that requires the alternate history writer to also give you enough background that you understand the history that we're providing you an alternate form of. Um, so those are the two, though, you, you've nailed it. Um, uh, that those are the two things I think that, um, that alternate history writers are very concerned with, along with, of course, being entertaining, being informing, um, you know, being a good writer, but you're really concerned with in your storytelling with being comfortable 
with what you present to the readers so they know where the turning points are in stories. So they're aware of those. So going back to like the results of alternate history, the second question was, how does the, does the author usually start with a targeted result um, of the alternate history? This, that's a classic, that's a classic um, question is, do you start at the start or do you start at the end? Uh, for any fiction actually, but certainly for, for alternate history. I think most alternate history writers would say they start with the hinge. They start with that moment that differs, um, which, which could be, um, you know, Caesar, Brutus's, Brutus and his friends' blades don't quite kill Caesar, he lives. Now we have a completely different Roman history. Um, the Battle of Actium goes differently. We have a completely different Roman history. So you're looking first sort of for that hinge, um, but then you're writing the story. And I would have to say, um, that for me, I have an idea and I start the story. I get about halfway through a short story. And then I think about the end and I write the last page or two of the story. And then I try to make sure the story I've started gets to that ending. To me, that works because that, that allows me to discard a lot of other possible things that might take me off on paths I don't want to go on. And it sort of forces me to stay on the path of the story that I wanted to write. Doesn't mean it always works out that way. Sometimes there's big changes. Um, you know, I always think of it as um, uh, dominoes falling. You know how you, when you're, when you're a kid or maybe when now when you're an adult, you set up dominoes so if you hit one it starts a whole path of dominoes falling well that's what happens to a writer um you think you have the whole story done and you change something at the one third mark and then all the dominoes after that start falling you got to make all of those work again you've got to make everything conform to that one change you've made somewhere along the line so i hope that makes some sense as a as a response so I have a question, Rick, and it has sure. to do with something we briefly touched upon earlier this week. And that is the idea that there's a price to be paid for a particular kind of behavior. And I'm wondering how closely that aligns with your Jesuit education and what that means. Ah, the one right. work that I didn't care for out of all of them, and I loved all the others, was the one where no one paid the piper, if you will. All right, so you mentioned that when, when first we talked, and, I've, and I've, given that, I've given that some thought. This was meant to be um, a collection of my sort of personal favorite stories. And my idea was it was about um, rambunctious um, young girls frequently um, because, because, because I'm, you know, I've raised, a, a rambunctious young lady, and uh, and I have a lot of uh, um, <laughs> um, nieces and nephews who I would say are the uh, the same way, but um, <laughs> but also um, you know I I frequently touch upon um, I, and I guess that's sort of a a Catholic thing maybe comes from part of being I I had a uh, Jesuit education Jesuit high school education. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. And the Jesuits in those days, I went to St. Louis University High School in, in St. Louis. And, um, and the Jesuits um, saved me um, sort of in, in religious terms. All I wanted to do was play football and basketball and baseball. And they constantly reminded me that I was also supposed to be getting an education. And it was a Jesuit institution which took education very seriously. So they did not allow me um, to not get an education. So by the time I graduated, I had a, a good education. And by the time I graduated, I had totally bought in to the Jesuit ethos, which was of service. Um, and the most important thing you can do is help others, is service to others. Um, and 
And I thought that was a, a sort of a, a great approach to life. It served me very well because five years later, I had a Down syndrome son. Um, and in those days, um, there was not a lot of help for that. So I sort of fell back on, on what I had acquired from the Jesuits to, to help get through um, all of that with a, with a special, needs, special needs son. And, um, and so see, it seems to me, I often, not always, but I often write stories where, um, where there is a price to pay, where everything, you know, there is no free lunch sort of, right? Everything, everything requires um, hard work and, um, and effort uh, and honesty and empathy. I'm really big on empathy. Um, I have a lot of sibling rivalries in my stories. If you stop to think about the stories you've read in I Rambunctious. I have it written right down here, rivalry. Sibling, sibling lots rivalries. of sibling rivalries. And my Alien Morning novel is all about sibling rivalries. And uh, the novel I'm, um, the sequel to that, which I'm, I'm turning in the latest and final go to print revision of that in the next week or two, Alien Day, follows that same path. Um, sibling rivalries, and and those those rivalries, um, I I guess I, you know I'm I'm um, I'm mostly a happy ending sort of writer, and um, and I would say most of the stories here have a pretty closed ending and a pretty pretty much of a happy ending. And I'm thinking of the story you're talking about, which is several items of interest. And, it, and at the end of that story, um, it's not all quite as dire as it seems to be at the end, because he realizes, I don't want to give too much of the story away. Um, but in that story, he, of course, the story was first published 20 years ago, so maybe I don't have to worry too much about that. And so, um, and so he, he, I'd like to think that sometimes the price you pay is a realization that you come to that you hadn't come to before. And I, I think that's what happens to Peter Holman in that story right. well, is he sure. begins to realize things. Mm -hmm. What was so curious about that story is how it just was to me a parallel to the world circumstance, the circumstance we find ourselves in, in today's world. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, um, I mean, I'm certainly not the only science fiction writer to, to fret over the future direction of the country, but I am interested in um, colonialism. And I am of the opinion that, um, that colonialism is just couched in different terms these days. Um, that... Um, you know, some countries, uh, some countries are, are still interested in exercising control over other countries. The United States is certainly one of those. The Russians certainly are, and we're rivals. And the Chinese certainly are, and we're rivals. And um, and it's not surprising that that the population of some of the countries that these great powers are trying to control get get restive about that control. And so what's happening in, in this story and several items of interest and others is that a generally benign alien uh, race has come to earth and is taking over and offering all sorts of benefits. But in return, there's a price to pay. And the price to pay is you have to behave how they want you to behave. Um, grow the crops they want you to grow so they can have um, so they can have the products they want to sell to other worlds. Um, all of this is the price you pay to have um, high speed travel and have medical technology like we've never had before and to have all these gifts they give you. Um, I'd like, almost nobody catches this, but the, <laughs> the Sudani, um, are based, of course, on the Hudson Bay Company. That's what Sudan is. And I've, and I've read a lot about, I found the Hudson Bay Company, uh, especially in Canada, uh, in the colonial era, to be very interesting. Maybe not 
quite as terrible as the East India Trading Company. Uh, but, but in those days of uh, especially mercantile colonial, colonialism, the idea was to construct um, a colony that would bring profit to you, to London, um, or to uh, or to Brussels or to wherever wherever you were from, and so that's what that story is trying to talk about. The price you pay for all the benefits you're getting is um, is that you have to behave the way they want you to behave, rather than the way you might behave otherwise. Oh, so you're you are. I stand corrected. There is a price to pay. I just felt terrible that at the end, Peter forgot about the pain that all the pain that had occurred for him to get into this yes. luxurious life that he had it seemed like he wasn't paying for it seems like he hasn't learned his lesson he didn't yet. learn his lesson and that he hasn't me learned his lesson yet right um i didn't want to Maybe tie that up in the next book well i didn't want to tie that up too firmly because i write a lot of sudani stories um, yeah. after my moberg stories that's probably the next most common stories i write is the stories of that mercantile empire. Um, you know, I like to think they're they're fun to read. I like to think they're entertaining. I like to think they have a point to make. Um, I'd like to think the stories in Rambunctious, pretty much all of them have a, a point to make about empathy um, and life and, and carrying prices. on. And carrying on. Like carrying pick on. yourself up and carry on. Yeah, well, thanks. That yeah, that's part of it. Just you know, um, yeah, get up and, and, and get going again. But sometimes the price to pay is pretty heavy. And, uh, and walking to Boston, um, he, the, the male character in that um, has come to really regret um, the, his actions earlier in, uh, in a very long marriage. Uh, but apparently it's too late for him. If you think about what happens at the end of that story. And the only way you can find out what happens at the end of that story is to buy the book. <laughs> I recommend doing it. It's as close as I'll come to a hard sell. Yeah, by I'll the way, I should. I, I'll, I'll recommend doing it because I really enjoyed the book. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, one of the things I'm doing, if anybody is interested, um, since I have a Down syndrome son, and I'm going to, if we have time, I'm going to read at least part of a, a story that's where Down syndrome is featured prominently. And it comes up a couple of other times in, in this collection. And it comes up a lot in my writing because I know it so well. Um, and that is since obviously all of my Down syndrome people in the book come from, ultimately come from my knowledge of my son. I asked him if he would autograph copies of this book with me. Um, nice. My nice way of saying thanks to him. I don't know if you can see this, but that's his signature. I do see it. <laughs> and it's, it's wonderful. I have pictures of him signing and he, and he total author look. He looks like, oh, <laughs> the signing is just, and he's signing away. Um, it was really, really charming. Um, well, and thank he's, you. A pretty, he's a pretty charming guy. So It'd be lovely if you read from your book. Well, all right. I, I, I would like to ask one question that, that comes up a lot and it doesn't have, need a long answer, but <laughs> it may sound like it does. Your routine for writing, how do you fit it in? What kind of time do you do? Do you squeeze it among other things, little pieces? Do you set writing time and, and say bullet points? I can do this, this, and this. Um, what I do is I write best in the morning. So I try to get up sometime at maybe six o'clock, have a cup of coffee or two. I can't read the newspaper because um, our daily newspaper now is online except for Sunday and Wednesday. Um, so I can't tang have a tangible copy of the newspaper. Um, and then I like to get started on a crossword. And for me, crosswords are sort of like calisthenics for a writer. Um, and then I'm feeling like I'm sharp enough, I can go back and, and write. And then I like to write essentially um, until something gets in the way or noon. Um, and then the afternoon is chores and then uh, the evening is usually for reading. Um, 
all of that goes out the window when I'm on a deadline. Um, and then I have to meet the deadline. I had um, just the other night, uh, Tor Books sent me a note and said, um, Alien Day's coming out and, and we need cover copy. We need you to write the back cover copy and the inside sleeve copy. And, um, and this was, I think, a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And I said, could you have it to me by Friday? <laughs> it's a book they've had for a year. And, um, and I said, well, sure, of course I can. But that meant I couldn't do my usual routine. That meant I had to get the copy done. Um, and there's a little bit of a story to that. I wrote the copy and that book, the Alien Day book, the sequel to Alien Morning, is really sort of wry, wryly satiric in parts. The writing style is less serious than Alien Morning and more um, sort of wry and sarcastic almost. Um, and I finished all of that copy and I thought, but this is dead serious. I can't do that. I got to rewrite it because it has to be as in the, in the style of the novel that is now done. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll sit down and do it. And in one of those strange and wonderful periods that happened to writers, it all came to me in exactly the right voice, that sort of wry voice I wanted. And I wrote what had taken me five or six hours to write wrongly, took me one hour to write a really nice version of it that I really liked. So those are the moments you look for as a writer when you're like in the zone uh, and you look up and two or three hours have passed and you've written a good chapter and things are moving along. Um, there are writers, I'm good friends with writers who write a couple of novels a year. I'm amazed at that. I, I just can't do it. I can write four or five, maybe short stories and one novel. I'm happy with that. I have to be happy with that because that's all I can do. So um, so I, I should tell you about uh, what happened with how rambunctious this book came to be. All right. And I'll read, read one story from it. Do we have time? One, yep. one other thing you yeah. did mention. That you always fit in time for biking or walking and staying healthy. Yeah, yes, I do. Um, I I cycle. I have a park near here, and um, and we have a, a one of those rails to trails uh, bike paths near us. And I make it a point to ride for seven or eight or nine miles every evening, um, just to get my exercise. And it's you know maybe ten miles an hour, kind of trying to get, trying to stay busy and, and stay at it. Um, and it's, um, it served me well. I mean, I've been, you know, reasonably good shape and athletic my whole life from a, from an athletic family. So I've always done that. And, and I can't do some of the things I can't run anymore. My knees won't allow it. Uh, but cycling, lucky me, um, still causes me no physical pain and just makes me feel good. So, right. so now I cycle, I cycle every day. Okay, well, let's get to the book. All right. So um, Kevin J. Anderson, very famous author, writing a hundred and some novels, best-selling novels, um, runs his own publishing company called Wordfire Press. And Kevin is on the same faculty that I am at the low residency MFA at Western Colorado University. It's the smallest of Colorado's state universities. Um, and so Kevin and I are, are pals. We, um, we were, a year ago, we were, uh, I went to acclimate. I'm at where I am speaking to you right now. I'm about 20 feet above sea level <laughs> because we live near the water. And, uh, and Kevin lives uh, near Colorado Springs at 6,000 feet above sea level. And the campus is at almost 8,000 feet above sea level which leaves a Floridian gasping when you, when you get off a plane and you've suddenly changed. So I went to his house to stay there for 24 hours just to sort of acclimate to 6,000 feet. And then we drove together over to the campus. And on the way, um, Kevin is an amazing writer. Um, he hikes all the mountains in Colorado regularly. 
You're right. He's, I think he's hiked all the 14ers, which is the 14,000 foot mountains in Colorado. And he dictates his novels while he's hiking. And then he gives the, the dictation to a typist who, who types them up. And he proposed we write a short story together. So the next day, uh, we talked all about the short story during the drive. And then the next day, um, he went for a local mountain hike in, uh, in Gunnison, Colorado, where the campus is. And he came back from that hike and he had, I don't know, like a six or seven or 8,000 word short story he had dictated while he was hiking. And he said, here's my, here's my stuff. We're collaborating on a short story together. Here, I'm done. And I thought, you know, <laughs> great, <laughs> great. I can't do that. So, so it was really a struggle. So he said, take your time, take your time. So he wrote his part in four hours and I wrote my part in four months. And we sent it to Asimov Science Fiction Magazine and the editor there bought the story and it, it'll be coming out sometime in the, in the next few months. Um, but it really, when I think of the, I think I'm writing really fast and I realize I'm actually really slow. It's like I'm the, the tortoise and I'm deluding myself. So, so Kevin really, really turns on the speed. And, um, and while we're talking, he mentions that he runs this very good pub, pretty, I mean, they publish a lot of books and he, we were talking about the, some of the stories here. And, and I said, um, I'm not happy with the publisher. And he said, well, I'll publish that. Um, so I pulled it back from the publisher where it was and, and I gave it to Kevin and now, you know, seven or eight months later, um, it was in uh, in production, and now it's out in hardcover and ebook um, and trade paper. This is the trade paper edition. So, um, so my feeling is I'm st sticking with with Kevin, uh, Word Fire Press. I have another book coming out from Word Fire Press with Alan Smale, the same guy I mentioned before, the physicist, and that's the book that has several stories, including the one um, where a traveling baseball team in the 1940s. Uh, winds up in Rome teaching the Romans how to play baseball. And it's meant to be a lark, a romp, a funny story. Um, and it just got a great review last week in Publishers Weekly. So we were overjoyed to see a nice review in, in PW. So what I'd like to read, I don't have a, let's see what, I'll know when to quit. All right, this is about, okay, it's done. So this is um, this is a story. So what I have been talking about with you this evening is um, uh, sports uh, and Down syndrome and alternate history. And alternate history, part of alternate history, is called multiverse stories. A lot of scientists uh, seriously think that there are many universes right next to each other. That's the only way you can explain some aspects of, of modern physics. Um, and so this gets in to all of those things, uh, Down syndrome, sports, um, and um, alternate realities. It's called Today is Today. And I'll... Starts off, starts off with this. You can think of our entire universe, our reality, as one bubble surrounded by an infinite number of other bubbles, each with its own reality. Do those bubbles touch? Can you cross from one to another? That's an entertaining possibility. And that's from Janine Marie Larson, PhD, Physics, University of Loyola at St. Louis. Now here's a hint, alternate history people. Is there a University of Loyola at St. Louis? No, it's St. Louis University in St. Louis. The point with that would be that's a little hint to people that that's a different, that's an alternate reality that she's writing from, which turns out to be very important in this story. So I won't cut in anymore. That'll be my only interpolated thought. In one tiny part of one of the new bubbles emerging from the bubble that is our particular universe, there's a place and a time where you might exist and I might exist. And I have a daughter named Janine. Perhaps in that tiny bubble, I was lucky with sports and found some success. 
a quarterback in high school. I'll have converted to a tight end in college at the University of Minnesota, or I'll bang heads and block like a demon and catch most of the passes they throw my way. I'll be all Big Ten, then a second round draft choice, then I'll make the team in St. Louis for the Brewers and get my chance to start when Rashid Campbell blows out his left knee, then I'll never look back. Seven years later, I'll wind down my career as a backup on the Falcons, but that will be their Super Bowl year, so I'll get my ring mostly by sitting on my butt. It will be a nice way to spend my 20s. I'll stay single and have a blast, though my body will take a beating. When I lose a couple of steps and the good times come to an end, I'll try to move to broadcasting, but that's a lot harder than you'd think. I won't be able to think that fast on my feet, so it won't work out. Still, I'll feel I have plenty of money for life as a grown-up, and you'd think I'd be happy. But it's hard to be a has-been, no matter how much money you've saved. I'll never marry, never have any kids, never grow up, really, and I'll know it. Later in life, I'll be lonely and bored and broke. And thanks to all that head banging on the offensive line in my football career, I'll literally be losing my mind. Eventually, I'll run out of money and run into trouble. And only then will I have any regrets. And another tiny part of another emerging bubble where you might exist. I'll break my collarbone in the second game of my senior year of high school. And by the time I'm back, the season will be over and my football career along with it. But my left-handed pitching skills will be unfazed by my fractured right clavicle, and I'll pitch us to the state championship where we'll lose by one unearned run. My fastball in the high 80s and my nice straight change will earn me a free ride to Loyola University, where I'll have four good years as a Billiken and five more in the minors before I'll hang them up and get on with real life in the business world. I'll meet a woman who loves me, and I, her, will marry and have two sweet kids. I'll have a good life and have some nice minor league memories from Tampa and Atlanta and Durham and Spokane. You'd think I'd be happy. In another tiny part of another of my emerging bubbles where you might exist, the Golden Gophers will keep me a quarterback and I'll do fine as the starter, though I'll never be a star and I won't make the NFL. I'll knock around a bit in arena football and then swim up to the surface as the quarterback of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Once in my nine years there, I'll lead the Thai Cats to victory in the Grey Cup. In the CFL, there's room to pass and room to run, and I'll do both. I'll meet a woman named Aline in my second season when we'll beat the Alouettes with a lucky rouge. We'll be celebrating at Yancey's on Hanover Street, and there she'll be, dark hair and blue eyes, stunning and smart and ambitious. I'll have had a good day on the ground, gaining 90 yards before ticking a stinger and coming out of the game. She'll have been there rooting for the Alouettes and seen that hit I took. She'll wonder how I'm feeling. Just fine, I'll say, though I'll have a worrisome headache. She'll be an actor, a smart and successful French Canadian who speaks four languages. I'll feel lucky. By my third season, we'll be married. By my fifth season, we'll have a child, Janine. We'll call her Janny. Janine Marie Larson will be born two weeks early on July 21st, a Saturday at four in the morning. Aline will have a rough time of it with a 15 hour delivery and then it will only get worse. Janny's feet, hands and the epicanthal folds at the eyes. Her muscles will all have a certain flaccidity even for a newborn. Trisomy 21, the doctors will say, Down syndrome. Aline will have been through ultrasound and blood tests and everything will have looked fine. But here will be Janet, here will be Janny and that will be that. There's a lot these kids can do, the doctor will say, as Aline and I both cry. Really, they can accomplish a lot. Really, the doctor will emphasize. We'll have a game that night at home in old Ivor Wynn Stadium against the Alouettes, and Aline will insist I play. So I'll go and do that, earning my paycheck with a couple of touchdown passes and a good enough night of football. I won't remember much of the game. All I'll be able to think about is Down syndrome. I'll go right back to the hospital after the game and Aline will be weak but smiling and more beautiful than ever. There will be a picture the next day in the Hamilton Spectator of her with the baby. The whole city will be behind us. I'll hold that baby and kiss her cheek as the cameras whir and click. Two years will go by when I won't play much. Some knee, some knee surgery, a discectomy for a herniated disc, a couple more concussions. The docs will say it's time to hang them up and so I will. Then about that time, Aline will get the movie role she's always wanted, filming in Vancouver. Our parting will be amicable. I'll get Jenny, and Aline will get visitation rights, and there she'll go, heading west. 
I'll have no reason whatsoever to be happy, but holding Jenny, I will be. There's another tiny part of a different bubble where Aline and I will stay together and things will go differently for Jenny. She'll be normal and fussy and hungry at birth and she won't stop being any of those things right through high school and college. She'll get her brains from her mother and her athleticism from me and get a full ride to play soccer at Rice where she'll major in physics. Then she'll choose brawn over brains and turn pro for the Washington Whippets before joining the national team in the Global Cup. She'll be a star and a household name after they after they beat the French on her hat trick to win it all. By that time, I'll be coaching football at Buffalo State and happy, happy enough with how I've reconciled myself on the paycheck and the fall from fame. But Hamilton will treat me well with a big ovation when I get there to see Jenny play a friendly against the Italians and she'll have a great day scoring a brace. We'll have dinner afterward and she'll be polite but distant and we'll smile for the cameras and then I'll go my way and she'll go hers. In a more important tiny bubble, Aline and I will do our best to raise Jannie to be everything she can be. Down syndrome be damned. After I hang them up, Aline's career will prosper and we'll do fine. We'll move to Vancouver where most of her work is and I spend a lot of time with Jannie. She'll be a sweet kid, but there are heart problems and a leg that needs straightening will create an uncertain future for her and me both as my football past and all those helmet hits come back to haunt me. Foggy mornings will turn into long dark days and I'll worry about just how long I'll still be me. I'll be in the dumps a lot, but I'll need something to do, someone to be, so I'll take care of Jenny one day at a time. Today is today. There'll be speech therapy sessions and school and all the rest. There'll be some joy in this, some deep satisfaction. It'll be my girl, my always girl. In this bubble, even as I lose some recent memories, I'll still remember certain moments from my past that were so perfect, where I was so tuned in, so fully one with the moment that I captured them completely in my mind in slow motion detail. I'll remember them vividly, even when I can't find my car keys. I will feel, feel the perfection of the past to Elijah Depp's deep in the corner of the end zone against the Argos. And I'll still watch in awe at that time, I swear I guided the ball in flight to bend it around Ryan Crisp's outstretched hands as he tried to intercept for the Blue Bombers. And instead the ball found Jason Wisson with no time left and we won. And I'll feel that joy too when Jenny on her 22nd birthday in one of her many special Olympic soccer games steals the ball off the player she's defending and sprints down the field with it dribbling like mad. She'll weave her way past three defenders, come in on the goalie, fake left and shoot right as an outside of the shoe push into the upper 90 for a goal. It'll be a great goal and everybody on both teams will come over to hug her and celebrate because that's how it's done in the special O's. I'll beam. That's my girl. There's another tiny bubble, one I imagine every now and then, where after my divorce, I'll spend a lot of time with a woman named Emily. She won't be bothered by Janny. She'll just want me to be me and Janny to be Janny and Emily to be Emily. And that bubble will make it work. And there'll be a new drug on the market for trisomy 21 and the sun will shine every day and the Yankees will never ever win the pennant, but the Ticats will be the powerhouse team in the CFL and my knees won't hurt and my mind will be clear. My memory's all there as Jenny goes off to college and the sun will shine every day in Hamilton, Ontario. One particular spot in one particular tiny bubble, Aline will be a grad student when we meet, an associate professor by the time she leaves for a post in Quebec. She can't turn it down and the stress and strain of raising, of raising Jenny is, um, she'll say, too much. So I'll have seen it coming for years, but we'll still do the divorce through the lawyers. As time goes by, she'll call Janny often enough and send her cards and cash on her birthday and Christmas. She'll even bring Janny up for a week or two to visit in the summer. Janny will do fine. By her 16th birthday, she'll be doing third grade arithmetic and fourth grade reading and tearing things up in Special Olympics soccer. This will be better than the school district psychologists thought Janny would, Janny would ever do. It will be so good, in fact, that after her birthday party, after the neighbor kids and her special pals are gone, after the cake is eaten, she'll be sitting on her bed, kicking a plastic toy soccer ball off the opposite wall, shoot it, trap it with a right foot, shoot it again, trap it, shoot it, trap it. I'll come in to stop the racket and she'll look at me, that wide face, those eyes. Her language skills aren't all that great, but from the look on her face, I'll be able to see something's up. 
my father shall say, I'm 16 now. I'll sit down next to her. Yeah, young lady, you're growing up fast. That's what I'll say. But what I'll be thinking about is all the things Janie and I have learned together, often the hard way. Boyfriends, how to handle her periods, what clothes to wear and when to wear them, how to tie her hair in a ponytail and put it in a different bow every day, how to ignore some people and pay attention to others, how to be so different and still be happy, tricky business, all of that. My father shall say, I not be like you or mom, mom. I'll be the lunkhead I am in every one of these bubbles, no question, but I'll be able to see where this is going. My Jenny, my hardworking girl is doing so well that she knows how well she isn't doing. She's been expecting grow, to grow up, to leave Neverland, but in this bubble, it doesn't work like that. Jenny, Jenny, I'll say, lying to her and not for the first time, struggling with how to handle this. Look, I'll say, we're all different, Jenny. We all have different things we're good at or bad at. She'll look at me, she'll trust me. I'll say, I wanted to be an astronomer, Janny. You know, look at the stars and figure out what it all means. I wanted that, Janny, in the worst way, but I couldn't do the math. But mom, I bet my mom could, Janny will say, smiling, getting into it. Yeah, Janny, your mom sure could. She's one smart lady. I'll be say that, but what I'll be thinking some other less generous thoughts about Janny's mother. To be kind, she's missed a lot of good things. Sure, my father, I get it, Jenny will say. And then she'll stand up to give me a hug and I'll hug her back and then I'll leave the room. Later out in the driveway, we'll shoot hoops and she'll seem fine. I'll join her in a game of one-on-one, -on -one, make it, take it, and she'll clobber me. I'll blame it on my bad knees. In my least favorite bubble, I'll die at age 52 of an aneurysm. Aline won't be around and I'll have no living relatives. I won't leave much money behind. Jenny will be stranded, alone unhappy, and there'll be 20 more years of her own decline into senescence before there's peace. In another bubble, Janny will be in an intellectual powerhouse. In high school, she'll think that calculus is fun and physics is entertaining. She'll have a perfect score in the science portion of the PSAT. Caltech will come calling, and MIT, and Yale, and Stanford, and Loyola, and Case Western, and Harvey Mudd, and Duke, and the University of Chicago. Astronomy in college, physics, biology, She'll find it hard to decide. She'll be patient with me in this bubble. She'll be understanding that her father is a decent guy, but not the sharpest tool in the shed. When she walks across the stage with that college degree, and then the next one, and then the next one, I'll be there in the audience, proud as I can be. In one particular bubble, the one that you and I share, Janny and I will be at the Brock Theater in Hamilton, where we both live in a two bedroom condo. Janny, in a group home, Janny is in a group home that she's recently moved into after years of living in her own apartment. Down syndrome people slide into early onset Alzheimer's, almost all of them. It's unfair, but there it is. Janny will be 30 years old and I'll be 57. We'll be laughing and joking about old age on that January day as we walk through the parking lot snow, as we go into the sudden warmth of the theater, as we buy our tickets and take our seats. Then we'll watch a movie something about memory keepers and cute down syndrome kids and the sweet and soapy ills of the world. I'll be squirming in my seat. Janny will be quiet. When we walk out of the place, people will be staring at Janny. She'll not be cute and she'll be shuffling some because of some knee trouble I probably caused her encouraging all that special O's soccer, getting her out in the basketball court with me all those years. We won't have played in a while. It will be snowing lightly as we walk away from the theater and get in the car, a beat up little Toyota that I'm determined to keep running. You don't get rich in the CFL. And there are better uses for my retirement money than buying shiny new metal and plastic. As I start the car and get the heater going, Jenny will look at me. I'll see it in her eyes. The movie was a bad idea. My father shall say, I am me. And she'll punch herself in the chest with her right fist hard. You are that, Jenny. You certainly are. I'll say that, kicking myself. Thank you, she'll say, and sit back and relax. There are all those different bubbles, but right then and right there, this will be the only one that matters. This is it, reality. We are who we are, and we are where we are. We're in this bubble, the one we share, the one where we do the best we can with what we have. We won't talk about the movie as we drive off and head for some ice cream and then later the group home. Instead, we'll talk hockey, 
father and daughter, something about the Sabres and how maybe they'll move to Hamilton and wouldn't that be great? Or we'll talk about Danny's bowling team where she's holding down that 96 average and I couldn't possibly be more proud of her. Or we'll talk about the Thai Cats and how much fun we had going to the games last year. And soon enough, the season will be back. And this year, for sure, the Thai Cats will make their way to the Great Cup. We won't talk about the path I've started walking down. Jenny wouldn't understand. But the reason she's in that group home is that they don't trust me to have her anymore. Mood swings, anger, all those hits and all those practices and all those games. CTE, my doc calls it. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And the league agrees. I have good days and bad ones. and She's safer in that home. I'm not happy about that. I was counting on holding Jenny's hand as we crossed that street into the confusion and then the darkness she faces. And now it's hers and she'll be holding mine. But that won't come up. We won't say much about anything. We won't need to. We'll just eat our ice cream and hang out together and enjoy this little bit of a bubble as best we can. This is our bubble right here and right now. Today is today. That's it. Wow. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Powerful. It was powerful. Thank you. Do I have a minute to say one more thing? Sure. Do we have a, do we have a few minutes? I Thank meant you. to say, I meant to talk about, I'm, I'm working on the, uh, oh, we have a few minutes. All right. The next book I'm working on is, um, is Alien Day, Notes from Holmanville, which is set, much of it is set in Western New York. Um, and, um, and the southern shore of Lake Ontario and set especially in the Niagara River where it's emptying in to Lake Ontario. And um, um, my two best pals from the good days we spent in Western New York uh, were Fran, Fran Sullivan, and James Ruggiero, Jamie Ruggiero. Um, all of this relates to soccer when our daughter was a pretty serious club soccer player, um, as was Fran's daughter and Jamie was the coach. Um, and I stayed in contact with both of them pretty well through, uh, through the wonder of Facebook. So I named a character in that novel after the two of them. And, um, and I plan to, whenever the novel finally comes out, some months from now, um, that character, Jamie Sullivan, will be driving a Chris Craft um, with the bad guys chasing them and the Coast Guard getting involved and the aliens in front of them and the whole world might end or it might be saved. And uh, uh, the brave and intrepid Jamie Sullivan is steering that Chris Craft down the heart of the Niagara River, heading toward this big alien edifice um, that he has to get the right people to at the right time. So Fran, thank you very much for being a pal all these years. And thank you for doing a great job guiding that Chris Craft down the middle of the Niagara River. <laughs> well, it won't be the first time I've driven a Chris Craft, but. <laughs> oh, good. Great. Great. I grew up, and with, I hope, I grew up, with, I grew up with a Chris Craft. I hope uh, Jamie Ruggiero was able to tune in for a little bit, but at least I have paid my respects to Jamie. Um, uh, he's a pal. Um, Fran and I um, got, got really got to be friends when our two daughters were doing some extra training at what was then still called the Pepsi Center, yes. uh, there by UB. And um, um, our, our daughters were, were friends running back and forth and working out, getting special training. And, um, and Jamie and I were friends because um, I thought he was a, a fine coach. He's also a big time model railroader. Um, and I have a terrible weakness for model railroads. Um, I'll never be able to do what he's done. He, he shows videos of it now and again on Facebook. And I'm, I'm in deep envy of that, but um, uh, but I just want to make sure I pay my respects to my my two best pals from our great years in in Western New York. Well, thank you, well, Rick. I want to give a plug here. The Pepsi Center has got a new name, but the guy you're talking about is John Offer, who runs Proformance. In those days, he was just getting it started, but what he ended up doing is training people like uh, various savers and so on. He made his money that way. But his, his heart is work with training kids and, and adults too, but kids. And so his prices for doing evaluations and training are um, unbelievable. And he's a guy who learned from the guy who, who trained uh, three world record holders. He really? also was trained, um, he trained the U.S. powerlifting and track teams in Colorado Springs. That's great. 
that's but that's great. that's the guy. I mean, he that's where. Yeah, that's I remember him really well. I remember him really yeah. well. And he doesn't forget anything. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to like me or you know. <laughs> now, Rick, if you're walking down the street, he'd come up to you and know your name. That's just the way he is. Really? Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. Those were good years. We really enjoyed our time in uh, in Western New York. We we liked Lewiston a lot. In some ways, we lived in between the two. Um, we lived sort of near the high school, which is sort of between the two towns, Lewiston and Youngstown. And I spent, I joined the Historical Society at Old Fort Niagara. It was just catered to all of my interests. And, um, and we'd put our, uh, our kayak in, uh, in the river or, uh, or down on the beach at Old Fort Niagara. And, and I became an avid cross-country skier. There were trails all around the fort that you would come at the end of the trail and you'd be on the bluff looking out over Lake Ontario and you could just see the top spires of Toronto all the way across the lake. It was fabulous stuff. And I use that, by the way, you read some of that if you if you read that one story in, uh, um, in here, the several items of interest. Um, I really, I talk about that all the time. I also talk about, I used to watch the lake effect storms off of Lake Ontario almost always missed our little corner of the state, but would just slam Rochester, as we all know. Mm -hmm. And you could actually see them going by and I would see cold funnels along the edge of the lake effect snow, like snow tornadoes going across the lake. It was the most remarkable thing. Um, I, we really enjoyed it, which is not to say that, um, that I miss uh, all that snow, but but as you guys know, Lewiston is um, only gets maybe forty or fifty inches of snow a year instead of <laughs> the south towns with ninety or a hundred or two hundred and get down far enough. We have lots of good memories from that area, so it's been a real joy to, to have this at least this virtual visit uh, oh, to the you. Buffalo area again. It's been a joy for us as well, and uh, maybe we'll see you in the future with another book. I hope so. Um, I'll, maybe I'll have to post a picture of Jamie on Facebook. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so um, I would I would like to say if anybody wants, maybe you could, they could contact you. If anybody wants a signed copy of the book signed by my down son and by me, um, uh, just contact us and, and we'll make it happen. Uh, hardcover or trade paper will make it happen. His signature oh, is you. much more, much more charming than my signature. And, uh, and he's real proud of the part he has paid, the uh, parts he has played uh, in this book. All and he right. should be. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We have a big decision to make and I hope that you'll all email me and uh, let me know if you'd like Rick's book and I'll put you in touch with him. But also, we need to know whether we're going to carry on through the summer months or rub back up again in September or October. So I'll, you'll be hearing from me with those questions. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. And Rick, again, thank you. Fran, thank you. Michaela, thank you. And good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night guys. I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's terrific. Thank you. Talk to you soon, Fran. All right. All right. Michaela, Emily, Mary, thanks.